This week, we're going to talk about why it can take such a long time for prices in the small business market to change. We're answering a viewer question, so stay tuned. I'm David C. Barnett, and you're tuned in to Small Business and Deal Making, the podcast, YouTube channel, and blog where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium sized businesses while controlling risk. So if you're looking to take control of your future through buying a business one day, or if you already own a business and you're looking to grow or exit, you've come to the right place. I talk about interesting things, I talk to interesting people, and I answer your questions every week right here. So be sure to hit like and be sure to hit subscribe, and let's get to it. Are you thinking of growing your business or beginning a journey into entrepreneurship? Take a shortcut to success by buying an existing and profitable business the right way. Visit businessbuyeradvantage.com and learn more about my online training, group coaching, and consulting services designed to help you win. All right, so let me catch up to speed because this question relates to a conversation that I was having over on, uh, on LinkedIn. So over on LinkedIn, uh, Clinton Lee had put up a post and he's a, a friend of the show. He's been on the broadcast a few times. Um, and he put up a comment about a valuation by a business brokerage over in the UK. And, uh, you know, it was kind of some cheeky comments about the fact that they, they didn't know what they were doing. So what I did is I, I reshared this post. My comment was that too often business brokers will use their initial evaluation as a tool to secure a listing rather than setting a realistic expectation in the mind of the small business owner. And my, and I further went on to say, this often backfires as the business becomes unsellable because of the value anchor set in the mind of the owner. So if you've done any reading about negotiation, anchoring is when you get this, this point set in your mind. So the, the business owner is told, you know, your business is worth a million dollars. They now in their mind imagine spending a million dollars or the lifestyle opportunities that this million dollar windfall is going to provide to them. And so when someone comes along and maybe evaluates the business and says, you know, this is worth 600,000 to me, um, it can be very difficult for the seller to understand the point of view or even to logically examine evidence that's presented as to why the cash flow of the business cannot support a million dollar purchase price, because in their mind, they've got this anchor set um, that may have been set by a broker that didn't know what they were doing or somebody who a business broker that was competing with other brokers and thought that giving this higher price might help them secure the listing over others. So in response to my posting, uh, this gentleman, Sven, says this happens in real estate also, but in real estate, the market fixes the problem and the price is lowered and the property eventually sells. Why does that not happen in business sales? So after the overpriced business is sitting for a while, why does the price not get dropped so it can sell? And this is just a fantastic uh, question. And that's what we're going to dive into today. And so the very first thing that we have to examine when we're thinking about a business and why the market for businesses would be different than the market for houses is we need to actually do some consideration as to what the heck a market is. So I went over here to Investopedia. Uh, and I found this article uh, simply called Market, What It Means in Economics, Types and Common Features of Markets. And we're going we're gonna to go through this. The, the definition here that Investopedia puts up right away is they say a market is a place where parties can gather to facilitate the exchange of goods and services. The parties involved are usually buyers and sellers, and the market may be physical, like a retail store uh, where people meet face to face or virtual, like an online market, etc. And where there may not be a physical presence between the buyer and seller. So th there's a whole article here, key takeaways, all kinds of things. And so I'm going to put a link to this article in the show notes below if you want to go read it. But in, in essence, markets have a couple of important characteristics. So number one, there is an arena of some kind. What does that mean, an arena? Well, it's, it's a place where the deals happen. And so in the world of small businesses, uh, there is no physical place where people go to buy and sell businesses. It is a, a virtual arena where people are interacting over the telephone, the internet, you know, emails, Zoom calls, all this kind of thing. Uh, they may eventually meet face-to-face, -face, a buyer and seller. Um, if, if you're talking about a real-world brick-and-mortar business, the buyer is obviously going to want to go and visit that business at some point. Um, 
And so that's the arena. It's just the place where people meet. And as you can well imagine, with no set specific place where deals are happening, it means that the people that are interacting in this market are not able to accurately observe each other. So your neighbor two doors down could also be out there in the world trying to buy a business and you may not know because you cannot observe the participants in this arena. So the other characteristics of a market is there are buyers and number three, there are sellers, okay? We know that there's buyers and sellers. Number four, a market has to have some kind of commodity being traded. So that's interesting. What is the commodity? Because that's what defines the market. So in the Investopedia article, they mention financial markets like a stock market where people are buying and selling the stocks of companies. And, you know, the stock market, people will assume, hey, that's a market, but it isn't really. The stock market is the arena. That is where the market is happening. Each individual stock has its own specific market. So the market for IBM stock is gonna be different than the market for Coca-Cola stock on the stock market, okay? Because each one of those stocks will have a different set of buyers and sellers. Now, some of those buyers and sellers may be moving between those two markets all the time. People who don't mind if they trade in either one of those stocks. But some people who only want to invest in you know, consumer goods are only going to be in the Coca-Cola market, while people that are more technology or manufacturing or maybe consultant uh, driven as far as what kind of things they want to invest in may only be investing in the IBM stock, right? So you, you can start to see when you, when you say that the market is only for the specific stock, then you start to see how, how the, sort of the lines get drawn and we get further and further refined into this definition of what a market is. So in the stock market, one of the other key elements that Investopedia doesn't mention, which is important in a market, is information, right? So while we may not know who the other participants are in the market for IBM stock, we do know one important detail, and that is the last price that was paid. And that information is fed to us in real time in the stock market, okay? And so all the market participants in the market for IBM stock are aware of what the last trade was at. And so this is a key piece of, the, of information to consider is that the knowledge in the stock market is perfect. We all know what the last trade was at. So um, the number of competitors obviously can have a huge impact on how the market functions. So well, I'm gonna get into the details here about the market for small businesses, but I want you to consider this stuff. Um, so sellers of small and medium-sized businesses are they competing with other sellers? Well, if we if we basically take the concept of the stock market being a, an arena where individual stocks are the actual commodity, then in the world of small businesses, each individual business has specific characteristics that make it special. So there's no such thing as a market for small businesses. Every business has its own market. I made a video about this back in 2016, which was called What I See in the Market for Small Businesses. We'll put a link to it here. You may want to check that one out. But the sellers are competing with other sellers. The buyers are competing with other buyers. But if, if people are unaware of who the participants in the market are, because remember, the market for small businesses is a secret one. There's, there's no stock market type listing for businesses that people can accurately identify which business is for sale are what we call a marketplace, you know, a website like Biz Buy Sell, they purposefully create an opportunity for people to anonymously list businesses so that the information is shrouded, right? So, so this is one of the key departures from the market for stocks versus the market for small businesses or you know, the market for real estate, for example. Here where I live, if my neighbor sells a house, it takes about a month after the closing of the house deal for the purchase price of that deal to appear on a publicly available website where I can go look. So while the information in the stock market is perfect and instantaneous, the information in the real estate or house market is a little bit delayed, but in the grand scheme of things, I've got pretty good access to information. So if my home is similar to my neighbor's home, 
uh, a month after they sell their home, I can find out what they sold it for. And this is going to be a quicker feedback for me to understand the value of my house, right? And so if we, if we look at the markets and we look at them in terms of the, the space they occupy, so things like houses would definitely be in a local market. There can be conditions, you know, in Manhattan that make houses trade at a different price than houses that are across the river in New Jersey, right? We all understand that. So, you know, geographical uh, location, proximity to employment, proximity to industry, proximity to transportation infrastructure, all these things are going to have an impact on the value of a house. A regional market might be the market for something like machinery. I'm a certified machinery and equipment appraiser. So I know that um, oftentimes when I'm looking at comparables for different types of machinery, the market for that machinery is going to change depending on what kind of machinery I'm looking at. So for example, if I'm looking at some office furniture, um, you know, that might be a poor example. Um, let's say a, a pizza oven, right? In a big city like Boston, uh, there's going to be a market in pizza ovens, used pizza ovens, because there's so many pizzerias that are there and there's going to be people coming in and out of business. And there's dealers of that equipment that are going to be offering this stuff up for sale that within the city of Boston, you can probably find a used pizza oven and there's a market in that city. But if we're talking about a bigger piece of equipment, like some kind of industrial equipment, then we might be talking about a regional market. So you might be looking at a tri-state area, for example, to find examples of that type of equipment being bought and sold. And, and the transportation of that equipment within that market space is going to be taken to, into account with its evaluation. Something like the stock market is a global market. There are people all over the world who might want to buy and sell IBM stock on the New York Stock Exchange, for example. And so depending on the type of business we're going to have one of those three kinds of influences that are going to be impacting the specific market for that specific business. So if we're talking about a local flower shop, the buyer, the seller definitely is a local player in that specific city. The buyer we know is likely going to be a buyer within a certain radius of that business. And so that particular flower shop is going to have a certain market defined by uh, the buyers and sellers available in that specific market. And at any given time, there may not be a lot of buyers who want to buy a flower shop in a given town, right? And so, so this is going to impact the efficiency of the market. Whereas at the other extreme, you know, an online business that can be operated from anywhere in the world is going to have a global market. And so there are going to be more potential buyers of that particular business at any given time. And so we should expect more fluidity in that type of business. The market for an online business should be more fluid because we have this global market of buyers that we can call upon. And in, in fact, when you, if you listen to some of the conversations that happen online, uh, businesses that are like that, these online businesses, if they're priced right, tend to sell more quickly just because there's a bigger pool of people kind of actively involved in that market. So, um, so let's specifically drill down here to the market for small businesses. Let's talk about its particular characteristics. So I've already said it's a financial market like the stock market and that each business for sale has unique characteristics. Um, you could say that all the subway franchises are very similar, and I would agree with that. You can also say that gas stations are very similar, corner stores are very similar, et cetera. And if you talk to any experienced business broker, what they'll tell you is that it's much easier and quicker to sell a subway or a corner store or a gas station than it is to sell a more specialized or unique type of business. So the more commodity-like the business is, probably the more people are going to be willing to step into the market for that business. Remember I said in the example with the stock market, you could have an investor that will be participating in the Coca-Cola and the IBM market. Well, if somebody wants to buy any convenience store in a certain metro area, they're willing to jump into the market of any convenience store that happens to be for sale in that specific geography. So that means more buyers available, right? Which increases the fluidity or the efficiency of the specific market for that kind of business. Information in the world of small business is not freeing, uh, flowing freely. It's not flowing freely. So number one, what's for sale? 
if everyone is participating properly in this market, we don't know because it's a secret market, right? Um, who are the people that bought or sold? There could be public announcements, there could be press releases, there may not be, right? So we don't know who's participating in the market. We don't even know for certain if a certain business has sold. Uh, a business could sell to a longtime employee and the seller might have a consulting agreement to stick around for a couple of years and they might not tell anyone. And from the perspective of anyone that operates or interacts with that business, they may not even know that the business has changed hands, right? We don't know. Um, what was the price? Well, there are certain private databases that collect this kind of data from business brokers and, and other people that operate in the market, but those databases are private and they're subscription based. And so the general public of business, you know, and the people who are interacting in the market, unless they're paying for that information, they may not know what other businesses have sold for. Um, and then what were the terms of those prices? Some of the databases do report the terms. Was there a seller note? You know, what was included in the transaction? Uh, some of them are more simple and they don't quite have all that information at play. So we have this information problem. And the other kind of uh, uh, a key thing about the information problem is a lot of times the information can be misinterpreted. So I'm going to, I'm going to get to that. So let's, let's get back to Sven's question. So Sven asked, why doesn't the market correct itself? I've identified four key reasons why it doesn't correct itself quickly like the market for real estate. So number one, there's a lack of feedback for informed decisions on the part of the participants, namely the seller. So because they can't see immediate real-time data on what other businesses like theirs are selling for, it's more difficult for that seller to be attributing the lack of sale to the fact that the price is wrong, they might be confusing it with another signal in the market, perhaps that there's not enough buyers. Now, for people out there looking to buy a, a good profitable business, you might say, hey, how can there not be enough buyers? Remember, every specific business has its own market. One of the classic examples I like to use is if you have a flower shop for sale and an engineer wants to buy a business, it's highly unlikely the engineer is going to buy the flower shop, right? And so some businesses can sit on the market for years waiting for the right buyer to actually enter the market and come and have a discussion with them. And so that's number one. Number two, um, information can be misinterpreted. So I've had plenty of conversations on here about different levels of cash flow, SDE, EBITDA, EBIT, et cetera, free cash flow. Um, I was literally listening to a podcast the other day where somebody who had already bought a business was talking about the, the journey of buying a business. The, the host asked them questions about business valuation and the guest actually said certain cash flow levels. And they said, you know, uh, 700,000 of EBITDA and what I would pay in multiples. And the host of the show said, okay. And, and the host started to say SDE. The two of them were literally having the same conversation. One was talking multiples of EBITDA. The other was talking multiples of SDE. Neither of them clued in. And they were talking about multiplication factors of cash flow in pricing a business. Now I'm listening to this in conversation saying, you two are talking about two different things that are going to lead to two different results. But the two of them in the moment never clued into the fact that they were talking about two different things. Now imagine somebody who's not an expert in the field, someone who's trying to learn this stuff, a business owner who's run a business for 30 years, never participated in a transaction. They go out into the world of online and start listening to some of these conversations about buying and selling businesses it's very easy for them to also be confused about these terms and these levels of cash flow. Let me highlight this to another degree. Let's talk about the, the real estate market, the, the commercial office rental market, right? So if you see an office space advertised for lease, they might say it's $12. So what does that mean? Is it $12 a month to rent the office? Well, probably not what it usually refers to is an annual price per square foot, right? But okay, so is it $12 a square foot? So for a thousand square feet, I'm going to pay a thousand dollars a month. Okay. But there's further complication. 
because in the world of office space, a price might be quoted to you as $12 a square foot net or $12 a square foot gross, $12 a square foot double net, $12 a square foot triple net. Well, what do all those things mean? A triple net lease means that the tenant is bearing the property tax, all the water and sewer bills, maybe even certain degrees of repair to the building are all going to be borne by the tenant. Whereas a $12 gross lease is going to mean that almost everything is included in that lease, property taxes, et cetera. But is electricity? I don't know. And sometimes, uh, you know, it's not clear. And so you need to actually talk about this stuff. Whereas, you know, one of these uh, executive centers might be advertising an all-in price, which might even include internet connectivity or a phone line, right? And so understanding what is happening, the information and understanding what data is coming back to you and then interpreting it properly with respect to your decision in the market as a seller is incredibly difficult, right? And so what do most sellers then do is they rely on some kind of guide to help them through all the complexity of this market. You know, if you're going to lease an office space, you can contact a commercial realtor. Some of these business owners will contact a business broker. So what if that guide or that broker is less than perfectly competent, right? And that was the example that uh, the original uh, posting from Clinton uh, was highlighting as he was talking about a, an evaluation that was not done very well. And so you can have people that are trying to sell a business and they're using a business broker who doesn't know what they're doing. I, I run into that all the time. Like, you know, and if you've been out there trying to buy a business, you've probably seen some utterly terrible packages put together or spoken with some brokers who really don't have any idea what they're doing. I had a, uh, I was listening to a podcast and during a walk and these business brokers were talking about operating capital and their conversation had a lot of holes in it. Uh, there were a lot of very basic concepts or topics about operating capital and small business that these guys w weren't even talking about. And, and, and these are the guys who are representing themselves to sellers as experts to help them sell. So, and number four, the fourth reason why the market doesn't correct itself is that the commodity is in a constant change of flux. Businesses are not static like a house. Um, you know, without proper maintenance and repair, my house will eventually fall down, but it's going to take years right? Uh, effectively, six months from now, if I don't do any maintenance, my house should pretty much be the same way as it is right now, right? Same can't be said for businesses. Businesses are constantly changing. And so that's another item that kind of complicates the whole, the whole marketability of this thing. Um, and here's the, other, here's the other thing. This is going to be the last big point about why the prices don't change. A lot of the times sellers will come into the market to sell their business and they'll have some overarching guidance on what price they need to get for their business to achieve some other goal in their life, which is not directly tied to the actual business itself. So maybe their financial planner tells them, if you want to retire, you need to sell your business for a million dollars. And so they want to retire. So they contact someone, a broker, or they put the listing up themselves and they ask a million dollars because that's how much money they need. This is jokingly referred to as aspirational pricing. It's what the seller wants, not anything to do with the actual business. And so that person is probably not going to agree to sell their business for anything less than the million dollars, absent any other compulsion. And so one of the most common things that I've heard from business sellers that come to me looking for help to sell their business, when I do an evaluation of their business, is they'll look at it and go, if that's all I can sell it for, I'm just going to keep it for a few more years and enjoy the profits, and then I'll put it up for sale, right? Which can be a completely logical course of action for many of these business people, totally. Because if they can't get what they need to retire out of a sale, then hanging on to the business, taking more profit out of it over the years, and then finally selling in order for the combined output put of the business to add up to that million dollars or whatever that they need is going to be a perfectly logical choice from their personal point of view, right? But that doesn't help the market correct the asking prices, right? And so the, the other thing would be 
what I mentioned earlier, the C word compulsion. It's very rare for a business to ever trade at a fair market value. It always trades above or below a fair market value based on the difference in compulsion between the buyer and seller. If you have a buyer that absolutely needs to buy a certain business, they will tend to pay more. If you have a seller that absolutely needs to sell a business, they're going to be the person who is going to react the way Sven um, proposes. They're going to be the one who keeps reducing the price to try to attract someone to buy it. I've seen examples of both situations. I've seen companies that you know want to expand to a new geography, and so they go in looking for someone in their industry, and they just say, um, you know, it's faster, easier, and cheaper for us to buy someone that already is operating get a new customer base, you know, put our name on the, on the, on the business and move into this new territory than it is to start our own location. So they'll go in and even if they have to pay more than the business is really worth, they'll do it. I've seen examples of this in the, in the business sale databases. And at the same time, I've also had situations where sellers were ill or getting divorced or had to move and they put a business up for sale and, and they're like, why hasn't it sold? Let's reduce the price. Let's communicate the fact that we're willing to do, you know, easier terms. I'm willing to finance more of the sale, et cetera. So, so I, I think I've handled Sven's question, but, but here are sort of the top level remarks about this market is that all of these inefficiencies in the market for small business are what makes it so exciting and attractive. Because what it means is that the people that are willing to roll up their sleeves and actually do the work to get out there and create the relationships and network and do the meetings and look for something that makes sense, they're going to be able to find it. While the people who just casually look at biz buy sell once a week, they're not going to be getting any of those opportunities. The, the fact that the marketplace is inefficient and, and has all of these problems is what allows people to actually find great opportunities. Anyway, Sven, thanks for the comment and the question, and I hope everyone enjoyed that. I'll put a link to the Investopedia article as well as the LinkedIn uh, post that, uh, that I based all of this on, and uh, hope that you're enjoying it. And uh, remember, if you're serious about buying a business, go over to businessbuyeradvantage.com. You can learn about all about the products and services that I offer to help people. And if you, if you want to be one of those buyers who really digs through the rubble and looks for the diamond in the rough, uh, then check out my coaching program because that's, you know, largely what the people in there are doing. Anyway, thanks very much. And, uh, we'll see you soon. So how can you learn more about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium sized businesses? Easy. Go over to my blog site, davidcbarnett.com, where you can learn more about me and how I work with my clients. You can learn more about my books and courses that I've prepared for you. You can find out how to subscribe to my email list, the YouTube playlists, and more. There's literally hundreds of hours of content there, all for free, and I'd love for you to be my guest. Special thanks go to Mark Willis at Lake Growth Financial, today's video sponsor. Mark helps people better manage their personal and business finances through the bank on yourself insurance strategy. This is something I've done personally and I've seen others use it successfully for years. Go to newbankingsolution.com to find all the interviews I've done with Mark and learn more about the advantages of these programs. While there, sign up for a free consultation to learn what this solution might look like for you.